Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about Elijah. Now, there are several people who have been asking for me to do classes on Elijah for a little while now. But for me, that is an intimidating subject because of, first of all, how important Elijah is. And second of all, how little I actually know about Elijah. But praise the Lord, we have scripture. In fact, we have a lot of scripture that talks about Elijah. And our Heavenly Father promises us that if we were to speak a word according to his will, then he will help us to get his messages through. And so I've said a little prayer before I started this class, hoping he would do just that. Come in and give me guidance on what to say concerning Elijah. Now, what I plan on doing is going down through the scripture, pulling out some highlights on Elijah. By the end of this video, you should know a lot about who Elijah is, what his jobs will be during the tribulation, who will be affected by Elijah. You will even have some hints on when Elijah will appear. If you've been wondering who the 144,000 are, if you've been wondering who the two witnesses are, you want to stick around for this class. But before I get started, I want to do a couple of things by way of housekeeping. One is I want to thank those individuals who are contributing to our channel, helping keep Hermes Academy online. People like Ruth Moeller, Grayson Google, and Stefan. These are just a few of the people who have made contributions. But there are several other people who have been contributing to Hermes Academy. I want to say thank you to these people, but I want to also ask you guys to say a prayer for these individuals, thanking them for their contributions. If it was not for them, you may not be seeing these videos. And so if you would go ahead and pray for these individuals. That's what the scripture is talking about when he says that he will bless those that bless me. And these people have truly been a blessing as they're taking up the burden of the finances that keeps Hermes Academy online. And another thing I want to do is say a prayer for the rest of us. Coming out of Numbers chapter 6 verse 24 through 26 says, May our Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and so be it. Alright now let's look at Elijah. As I said, I ha I've hesitated to do this class on Elijah. This is an extremely important figure in the end times. Because of his level of importance, I'm afraid some of the people are actually going to choke on, a f on Elijah's role. Especially those who this is the first time they've actually heard anything on Elijah. They might find themselves quite scandalized on who Elijah is in the third era. But if you've been around Hermes Academy any time, you know that I can back up anything that I say scripturally. I welcome all challenges. I welcome you to fact check everything I say. But talking about Elijah, let's jump right into the scripture. I don't have much battery power, so I better go ahead and get on with it. First scripture that I want to bring out is the last chapter in the Old Testament. The very last chapter in the last book. Even the last three verses here of the Old Testament. Looking at Malachi chapter 4. Now you see Elijah mentioned there in verse 5. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now this is where we're at now. We're waiting for this great and dreadful day of the Lord. This day has many names it goes by. Some people call it the rapture. Some people call it the day of the Lord. Some people call it the hour of the conscious. Some people call it the third temple. Um, the start of the tribulation. There's all, there, there's all different kinds of ways to look at this great day that's going to occur. But one thing I want to point out for individuals who are looking forward to this day. There's plenty of scriptures that say you actually shouldn't be doing that. Nobody should be looking forward 
to this day. It is actually going to be a dread, a dreadful day. It is going to be a bad day for everybody. You know, there's a lot of people who they've centered their whole lives around waiting for this day. According to the scripture, that's an error. Nobody should be looking forward to this day. We should actually be thanking our Heavenly Father. We have more time in order to prepare for this day. Because look what it says up here in verse 4. He says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. See, now this is talking to all Israel. He's talking to spiritual Israel here. There's three different Israels in this world. There are the bloodline Israel, who if they do their DNA, they will find themselves in an E1B haplo group. These are the people with blood ties to Israel. Then you have the second group, which is the nation of Israel. Those are the people who actually dwell in Jacob's tents. Over there in Israel today, these are the same people that's trying to erase everything I just told you before about that haplo group. These are the people that don't want you to know the bloodline Israel. They are working to supplant the real Israel. And then you have what's called spiritual Israel. We've done classes on who spiritual Israel is. If you watch this channel a lot, or even if you don't, you watch other channels where you are doing just this, remembering the laws of Moses. And you're also on watch waiting for the return of the father. You are probably what they call spiritual Israel. Those are three different groups. So look what he's talking about here. He's telling them to remember the laws of Moses and the statutes and the judgments. These two verses, I believe, are connected here. Implying that if you are to remember the laws of Moses and keep the statutes and the judgments that you can read about over there in Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23. That's four chapters. I would read it if I were you. That's called the book of the covenant. That's the covenant that we're actually under right now. You heard people say stuff like covenant breakers. Well, if you are a covenant breaker, that's the covenant that you're breaking right now. Exodus chapter 20 through 24. As we are awaiting on the new covenant, which then the laws will be written on our heart. Those laws given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy will be written on our heart. And you won't have to worry about reading them anymore because they'll be a part of you. They'll be locked into your conscience. But until that day comes, we have to go over and read the book of the covenant. I say for the third time, Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23. You do these things. He says, behold, I will send Elijah, the prophet. And we're going to find out how we can expect to see this Elijah, the prophet. There's some channels out there that teaching that this is a man. This is one person. Don't don't go for that, guys. The Messiah is not going to come back as a person. Elijah is not going to come back as a person. The Antichrist is not going to be a person. The lawless one may be a person and the willful king may be a person. But the Antichrist, just like Elijah, will not be one single man walking around. You'll see as we get down through this study just how much power this guy has. And you'll know that there's not one person that can do all that he going to be able to do you remember when the messiah came as one person he was very limited in what he was actually able to do walking around in a physical body spoiler alert this elijah is going to be a spirit figure he's going to be a spiritual being but we're going to prove that by way of scripture going down through here now look what he would do right here before we move out of malachi it says and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a sword. Okay, now this is a little bit tricky verse right here because it's using the word father. But the Bible never mentions daddy. So every time we see the word father, we have to understand whether he's talking about our heavenly father, which is the father of our spirits. He's our universal father. Or if he's talking about our daddies. Which, you know, we all look like. 
in the physical. But whoever this father it is that's talking about, he's saying that this is going to be the role of this Elijah figure is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. These three verses are tied together, guys. I want to stress that for importance. Remember in the law, the Elijah the prophet, earth with a curse. If we keep the law, statutes and the judgments, the father will send the Elijah the prophet. Our hearts will be turned to our children and our children's hearts will be turned to, a, to the fathers. And the father won't smite the earth with a curse. All right, let's go on. The next thing I want to do is I want to jump over to a book called The Apocalypse of Elijah. If you're new to this channel and if you're new to the scriptural world, one thing you have to understand is that there are a lot more scriptural documents than we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. That's why I believe the number is 66. We have 66 books is because we are clearly being told that those books are incomplete. The number six means incomplete or the number of man. There are a lot more books than 66 books. I mean, a lot more books. These are all scriptural documents. Some of which you may have heard of in the Apocrypha, some of which you may not have heard of. But we understand that the father wanted us to know all of this information. That's why he had his prophets to write it. And we also understand that this information is being hid from us. That's why they call it the hidden books. The word apocrypha means hidden books. They are hiding these books from us. And you have to wonder why are they hiding these books from us? And I'll go ahead and tell you. It's because it doesn't support their agenda. Many of these books that they're hiding from us do not support their agenda. Their, their agenda is based on materialism and world dominance. Two things that the Bible is opposed to. That's why you read so much in the Bible how the Father's kingdom, the kingdom age, will have neither materialism nor a world government. Both of them things are going away but man doesn't want you to know that so he hides that stuff from you and one of the books he hid from you was the apocalypse the apocalypse of elijah which describes in detail the lawless one that one that people call the antichrist the apocalypse of elijah goes in detail describing where where when he's going to come what he's going to look like what is he going to do when he gets here? And a lot of other details. Remember the scripture says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but, but against wickedness in high places. Well, it is these wickedness in high places that is implemented by these kinds of books. And those people have authority to remove those books from the Bible. They actually took those books out of the Bible. And they're doing so, so that we don't turn back and look and say, hey, this book seems to be describing you and your actions. Instead of them having to deal with that and answer questions related to that, they just remove the books from the Bible altogether. And now you don't get to read them. Unless, of course, you want to and you're willing to go find them, including in the description of this video where I give you links to them. The Apocalypse of Elijah and just about every other book that I'm going to mention here in this study on Elijah. Now, but let's jump down here to verse 7. It says, Then when Elijah and Enoch hear that the shameless one has revealed himself in the holy place, they will come down and fight with them, saying, Are you indeed not ashamed when you attach yourself to the saints because you are always estranged? Talking about Enoch and Elijah. These are your two witnesses that we are expecting in the end times, Enoch and Elijah. 
Now understand the difference between these two individuals because there's actually three of them. The third one is not mentioned because he does his work in the spirit world. Like I said, I like to be challenged on everything. Dare me to show you the verses on that. You have three of these guys. The other one does his work in the spirit world. The two that we are expecting to come down here to earth are quite different. One is a doer. One is the type of guy that went up against Jezebel and Ahab and the, and the prophets of Baal. That is the Elijah type figure. The other, the Enoch type figure is described. He's the one who heard from angels and wrote the first books ever written on earth. The books of Enoch, which have also been removed from the Bible, which even the Messiah referenced several times in the gospel. You're looking here in this portion of the apocalypse of Elijah and you can see when you are expecting these two witnesses to show back up. It's in relationship to the lawless one. When the lawless one is doing all of these evil acts towards the saints, it is then that you see these two witnesses show up. And this is actually confirmed over there in Revelations. You see the two witnesses mentioned over there in Revelations in chapter 11. Verse 3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. This happens immediately after or simultaneously with that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Some people call it the rapture. Some people call it the hour of the conscience. This is talking about that third temple. That's why you see up there in verse 1, he is measuring the temple. That temple that is to be built on the hearts of humanity. Now, like we said earlier, anybody who's saying that Elijah will be one single man, those are the same people that are telling you that the third temple is going to be made out of bricks. Now, there probably is going to be a temple in Jerusalem made out of bricks. And there's probably going to be some dude over there talking about he is Elijah and he's probably going to be in close proximity to the guy that's claiming that he is the second coming of Christ. Both walking around in the flesh, both that you can see with your naked eyeballs and both are lying. The Messiah is will return on a cloud just like he left. He will return on the consciousness cloud. That cloud that he's talking about is the spirit world. If we can see ghosts and stuff walking around, they would look like a cloud of people. There's way more of them than there are of us. They're described as having white light or like a white light. And so if we can see them, we, they would actually look like a cloud to us. Like I said, I like to be challenged. Dare me to show you the verses on that. But in the meantime, we jump back over here to the apocalypse of Elijah. And like I said, in this verse, it tells you what he looks like. It tells you what his sons look like. But let's go on down here to the last chapter in the apocalypse of Elijah. Looking at verse 32, he says, after these things, Elijah and Enoch will come down. They will lay down the flesh of the world. They will receive their spiritual flesh. They will pursue the son of lawlessness as, and kill him since he is not able to speak. This is some important stuff right here in this verse. For one is telling you about the timing. If you go back up here and you look at what's going on with the with the lawless one, you can see some of the stuff that he does before these Elijah figures show up. This lawless one is actually torturing those people that are keeping the commandments. You see right here in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation is that they make war 
with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God. Now this is why a few people don't want to keep the commandments is because they don't want to face this war. These are the same people who always want to be on the winning team. It's like they'll switch horses in the middle of the race because it seems like that other horse is going to win the race. And so they like, hey, if they're going to make war against the saints and those that keep the commandments, I want to be on the other side. It's not a wise choice, guys. They lose. They might make war with the saints and those who keep the commandments and those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But they, but they lose that war. We are on the winning side. Those of us who keep the commandments. That's why they call it Jacob's trouble. It's because these people come against these individuals. The remnant is Jacob. And this lawless one actually targets them. You can see a lot of this going on in the world if you know who Jacob is. You know, we don't try to go into race on this channel. We talk to everybody on this channel. But if you know who Jacob truly is, that's why he said Jacob's trouble and not Israel's trouble. There was a transformation that Jacob made when he decided to embrace the father as his God. He was changed. His name was changed and he was changed from one individual to another individual from Jacob to Israel. Well, they call it Jacob's trouble for a reason. They don't say Israel's trouble. They say Jacob's trouble. Why? Because Israel, like we talked about earlier, are those who are keeping the commandments. And if you look over in Daniel chapter 12, you will see that those who keep the commandments will have a protector named Michael, the archangel, who will protect those guys. It is the Jacob that ain't keeping the commandments that's going to have all the trouble. Guys, during the tribulation. But let's look back over at, here at this verse. I don't like to get too preachy on these type of videos. I know there's a wide range of people watching these type of videos. But if you like understanding what the law is, if you like understanding what it is that we're supposed to be doing in these end times in order to survive this tribulation... Subscribe to our channel. Hit that bell button so you can see when the classes come out. That's what our channel was about. We are the repairers of the breach. Restoring the paths to dwell in. So we teach on righteousness and holiness over here. Just put out a class. Our last class we put out was a very important class on the Sabbath day. If you plan on surviving the tribulation... Go over there and check out that class on the Sabbath day. It's extremely important. But anyway, let's go on. Notice right here where it says Elijah and Enoch will come down. Everywhere you read in the scripture, the stuff is coming down to us. New Jerusalem is coming down to us. Ain't nothing going up, guys. Ain't nothing going up. Everything is coming down here. Kingdom of heaven is coming down here. That's going to be a place on earth. That we will be under the reign of the Messiah. Under the reign of our heavenly father for 1,000 years. That's coming down here. Enoch and Elijah is coming down here. Notice this part right here though. They will lay down the flesh of the world. And they will receive their spiritual flesh. Enoch and Elijah will be spiritual beings. They will be spiritual. They will not be a person that you're going to be able to lay your eyeballs on and walk around and worship and, and, and you know, talk to and, and get over in your camp. So you can say, hey, we got Enoch over here. We the blessed group. Y'all ain't got Enoch over there. Y'all ain't. No, he's not going to be stuck over in Jerusalem or stuck over here in the United States. This is going to be a spiritual individual on the consciousness cloud or on the spiritual cloud. It's going to be all over the world. We're going to find out here. And what is he going to do? He says they will they will pursue the son of lawlessness and kill him. 
These are going to be who destroy the son of lawlessness. And we just did a class on this a few days ago, who this individual is. It might have been a class we done a day before this one or two days before this one or maybe three days at the most before this one talking about who the lawless number one is. We went into great detail on that class. Who he is, what he looks like, when he's going to be here, what he's going to do when he gets here. But it is Enoch and Elijah, these two spiritual beings that's going to destroy him. All right, now let's come over here and let's look at the third testament of the Bible. Some of you guys are new to this. If you're new to this channel, you may not have heard about the third testament of the Bible. This is the third part of the trilogy. This Bible has been suppressed by a lot of people, including a, including a lot of YouTubers out there doing their part to suppress this scripture. Is because just like the apocalypse of Elijah, just like the book of Jubilees, just like the books of Enoch, they all tell you that you are supposed to be obeying the commandments. They all tell you how it is that you're supposed to be surviving the tribulation. And these people who have these other agendas don't really want you surviving the tribulation. They want you keeping them rich and popular and exalted. The world leaders, you think our president wants you to understand spiritualism? You got another thing coming. Spiritualism is the opposite of world governments. The new world order will not survive once the world turns towards spiritualism. That's what's going to destroy this new world order is spiritualism. Spiritualism. And I ain't talking about new age. That was man's try at spiritualism. That was man trying to do some stuff just like man was trying with religion. Man's attempt to do stuff was all of that new age stuff that he was doing over there. But I don't want to take anything away from those guys because they had the right mindset trying to understand spiritualism. The new agers were on the right path. They did understand the goal of where they wanted to go. They might not have knew how to get there, but I give them credit for knowing that they were supposed to go there in the first place. And that is spiritualism, the third temple, the hour of the conscious. I'm trying, I tried to pack these videos with a lot of information, guys. You need this information. You need this stuff. You know, some of it may step on your toes and all of that, but hey. It's like a big dose of medicine. You know, it may taste bitter going down, but it's going to help you in the end. All right, we're over here looking at the third testament of the Bible. This is the third part of the trilogy. When Moses came down here, the world was going through a big change and humanity needed a set of rules to go by. And so they got the Torah and the Old Testament of the Bible about 2000 years before the Christ showed up. And then when the Christ showed up, the world again was going into a new era, a new change, going into what's called the 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 Piscean age when we was at Moses time we was going into the age of Aries in, in the Messiah's time we was going into the age of Pisces every 2000 years humanity changes the world changes the universe changes in this manner and now once again we're about to change as the world goes from the age of Pisces into the Aquarian age and as we enter the Aquarian age just like in the other two ages Aries and Pisces we have have gotten a new document a new set of instructions that helps us to learn what it is that we need to know in order to survive this new age it doesn't take anything away from the new testament just like the new testament didn't take anything away from the old testament they add on to one another the third testament of the bible adds on to the new testament and the old testament and it goes as far as clearing up a lot of the misunderstandings of the Old Testament and the New Testament I would say because I'm advised to say that you have to have the third testament of the Bible in order to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament extremely important stuff 
You can find a link to it in the description. You can also find a audio book all over YouTube. Just put in Third Testament of the Bible, chapter one, or something like that, and you'll find chapter one. There's 66 chapters to this book. Highly powerful. There's individuals that's gone in and tried to discredit this book. Some of people that y'all probably look at on YouTube try to discredit this book. Their efforts have been futile. I've given them all the opportunity to try to show how they are uh, uh, contradictions in the Third Testament. And all they did so far, I'm still they're, they're still welcome to try. But all they've done so far is prove that the Third Testament is legitimate is inspired they've tried their best after slandering it and calling it all kinds of bad names everything they did to try to disprove it only proved it even more this was one video right here uh, planet planet X found in hidden scriptures where there was a huge debate about the third testament with one of your most popular YouTube teachers We'll try to discredit it. You can go over there and you can check out that video. Check out the comment section of that video. And you can see the blow by blow, blow of that debate. As we went back and forth. Proving that the third testament is legitimate. So let's see what the third testament has to say about Elijah. First of all we see that in chapter 2 of this book. There's a whole section on Elijah the forerunner. A whole section. We're going to touch on that a little bit. But that's but some of that is actually beyond the scope of this class. We want to talk about Elijah himself. And this goes into a lot of detail on some of the other stuff that he did when that when we worried about what he's going to do. We want to focus more on the futuristic stuff than the past. There's a section over there in chapter nine that talks about Elijah. But in that section, it's talking about the Elijah figure that walked around back there in Ahab's time. Now, here in chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we see some important information about Elijah. One of the things is he was res responsible for this third testament of the Bible. Just like before with the Messiah and John the Baptist, the Elijah spirit dwelled inside of John the Baptist and paved the way for the Messiah to come. That was the first coming of the Messiah. Well, this Elijah figure did the same thing back there in about 1866 when he came and dwelt inside of a man called Ro Roges and paved the way once again for the word. The Messiah was the word made flesh. This time in 1866, the Elijah spirit was paving the way for the word. And this time that word was in the third testament of the Bible. The third testament of the Bible is actually the second coming of the Messiah. Guys, don't confuse the second coming of the Messiah with the day of the Lord. Those are two different events. The second coming of the Messiah who is the word made flesh. You gotta remember that part. When you're expecting the Messiah to come back. You really should have been expecting him to come back in the word of God. That's who he is. That's what Revelation said over there. In Revelation 19 and 13. You see that when the Messiah comes. His name is called the word of God. This is the individual that's riding the white horse over there in verse 11. He's called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. This is the individual in verse 12. It says his eyes are as the flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. But look right here at the end of verse 12. He says, and he had a name that no man knew but himself. No man knew his name but himself. But then you look right here in the very next verse and he says, and his name is called the word of God. It should be really easy for you to understand that the Messiah was the word made flesh in his first coming. And he is actually the third testament of the Bible in his second coming. Like I said, I'm giving you guys a wealth of information and I'm hoping that you would challenge me on some of this stuff. 
But the Bible, but the third testament of the Bible goes in detail telling you how just like in his first coming, people didn't expect him to come that way barefoot and homeless. And they rejected him because he didn't come in a manner that they was expecting him to come. This will also occur in this age because they're expecting him to come back as a man, I guess, barefoot and homeless again. But this time he's coming in the word of God and that's not the way they're expecting him to come. So they are rejecting him yet again. And, you know, if you understand reincarnation, you understand that these are the same people. The same people that didn't get it the first time or the same ones that ain't getting it the second time. Those of us who can recognize the father's voice, all we got to do is read the book. You know, we don't need nobody telling us what to feel, think or believe about it. All we got to do is pick it up and start reading it. About an hour in, you'll be thoroughly convinced that this is the word of God. And you read the whole thing through and you'll be thoroughly convinced that this is the second coming of the Messiah too. promise you that. Challenge me on it though. Now here we are down at this section down here. Elijah as the forerunner of the Lord. See, I says right here, I sent Elijah to return as to return in the third era. Again, this is the era that we're entering in now, beginning the Aquarian age. Every 2,000 years, we get a new document. This is the last one we're ever going to get because the planet ain't going to last that long. The planet ain't going to be here for another 2,000 years. So we won't get another testament. This is the last testament. But this is why you hear people talk, talking about the third Elijah. Moses was the first Elijah. John the Baptist was the second Elijah. Now you're getting the third Elijah. Who helped write, who's helped responsible for this book here. You got to remember over there in Malachi, the father told us he was going to send him. Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Some people think about this as judgment day. But the confusing thing about judgment day is they want judgment day to be 24 hours. No, judgment day lasts for a thousand years. We've been in judgment day for a thousand years. Challenge me on it. You don't believe it? Challenge me. You know what I mean? You got to you got to understand that a lot of people who have been hiding this information from you is the same people who are teaching you in the church. So it shouldn't be surprising that you've never heard this before. I mean it I mean why would they hide it? Take the time to hide the whole book from you and then turn around and teach it to you. You should you should see what they actually teach down at them seminary schools. They don't teach those people down there to explain the truth to you. They teach them how to dodge the truth and how to shut you down when you try to start asking questions. When you start trying to un understand the truth and start trying to get answers to those questions, those seminary school graduates have pre-scripted answers in order to shut down your argument. Make you stop asking questions. So you can never really get at the truth. That's seminary school. Now, I said I didn't want to dwell on the past too much, but you can read in this part right here if you want to about the Elijah figure and this Roe Rogers individual. Now, there's a misconception that the Roe Rogers individual uh, wrote the Third Testament of the Bible. They're quick to go in and try to slander this dude's name and then thereby they can slander the Third Testament, you know, saying that he wrote it. He actually didn't write it. You know, he was the Elijah figure. He came first. I shouldn't explain that to some of these people. You get tired of answering some of this foolishness that these people be talking about sometimes. You just want to tell them just to go read it. You know what I mean? I lock them in a room with some loudspeakers that just playing a third testament for, you know, for them for a few hours and force it down their throats. You know what I mean? Just, just read it. Stop speculating and listening to other people speculating and coming up with all of these blasphemous stuff to say about the word of God you're talking about the you're talking about the Bible here you're talking about Jesus here when you slander this document you talk you, you might as well be slandering the Messiah but yet they will instead of reading it for themselves and getting an understanding of it for themselves first they eventually do you know they don't never come back over and say uh 
Well, actually, one person came back over and said, I apologize for, you know, the bad things that I've said, but I've actually went in and read a large portion of this book. And now I'm thoroughly convinced this is the word of God. They, you know, those other guys, those prideful individuals, they ain't gonna never do that. See, this right here in verse 38 of chapter two, this is why they talk about the third Elijah. This is what I was talking about in the beginning of this when I said the importance of this Elijah figure. Look, look at who he's with. This is the importance of this Elijah, Elijah figure. This was the transfiguration there on Mount Tabor back there with the Messiah. These are the individuals that came. You had these three individuals standing there, Elijah, Jesus and Moses. That should tell you how important this Elijah figure is. Elijah is the third of this group here. Moses came first, then came Jesus, then came Elijah. This is why I say some people are going to choke on it. Because they're like, oh, I ain't nobody else but Jesus. Jesus is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Heavenly Father. You know, but this ain't no bad Ellie Murphy movie. He, he don't play every single role in this movie. He actually has other figures. He actually has other players in this thing. He don't have to do everything. He doesn't do everything. Our Heavenly Father doesn't play every role. Jesus is our Heavenly Father. But he doesn't play every single role. He was right there in the middle. Moses was first. Then came the Messiah, Yehoshua HaMashiach. I know I'm getting on some people's nerves saying Jesus, but Yehoshua HaMashiach came second. Now we got Elijah. Now we got Elijah. We need to wrap our heads around that. You know, the truth is the truth. Just because we don't like it, don't make it less true. Just because we don't understand it, don't make it less true either. Let me read this part right here. Elijah, like Jesus and Moses, came to illuminate the eyes of your spirit so that you will behold the father. Moses taught you to love your fellow man as thyself. Jesus said to you, love one another. Elijah ordered you to have charity and more charity towards your brethren. In other words, Moses told you to stop killing people. The Messiah told you to start loving them instead. Now, Elijah tells you to start having charity towards them and start treating them like brothers. Actually go out and do something. This is what they call evolution. This is our spiritual evolution here. Now, notice this part right here. Once you do all three of these. He says, and you will behold my father in his splendor. Then. You will hold my father in his splendor. You ain't just going to be able to just wait around, you know, and, you know, for the rapture to come and you're going you're gonna to see the father. You, you Look, guys, I'm offering you this information. You're going to have to do what's talked about here. You're going to have to do what's talked about over there in Malachi, too. And he said, remember the law of Moses. You're going to have to do this stuff. The Bible ain't no joke. Father is not like humans. He don't change his mind. You know, once he say something, he, he meant it. He, the rules don't go away. The old, ain't nothing going away about the Old Testament. Ain't nothing changed about the Old Testament. Ain't nothing changed about the first covenant. All that stuff is still in effect. Every covenant that we've ever gotten from the, no, from the covenant given to Noah, the covenant given to Abraham, the covenant given to David, the covenant given to everybody. Those covenants are still in effect till today. The Father don't change in that manner. All right, now here's a verse talking about the timing right here. We're all the way up in chapter 2, verse 39. It says, when the darkness that has covered humanity disappears and light is manifested in the spirits, you will feel the presence of a new era for Elijah has returned among men. Elijah plans to return among men. We already said he was a spiritual individual. Now he's that spirit is going to come down here with man the same way that John the Baptist. I'm going to go ahead. Spoiler alert. The same way that Elijah came and dwelt inside of John the Baptist. One individual. That's going to happen for several individuals. In this era. Now, that may be difficult for you to think about, but think about it like this. You understand one hundred and forty four thousand. This 144,000 
are the modern day disciples of Christ. Let me say that again. They are the modern day disciples. They are his disciples of today. That's why they are going to help us to survive the tribulation because just like those disciples of old time walked around with the Messiah learning from him firsthand, these 144,000 are also going to be walking around getting these rules, these instructions firsthand. And so when the tribulation kicks off, they're going to be the ones that is actually able to lead us through the tribulation, understanding the rules, the regulations, the statutes, the judgments. So I can keep going on and on. They, they going to understand understand these rules they've been in training for a number of years now and they still got some training to go these individuals going to understand these rules and when things get hot and heavy they're going to be the ones who's going to stand up like the captains on the football field to lead us through the tribulation there's 144 of these disciples but back then in john the baptist time there was only 12 of them you ever heard the term, we don't die, we multiply? Those 12 individuals that walked around with the Messiah multiplied into 144,000 individuals that you have now. Well, it's going to be the same way with that one individual that was in John the Baptist. He too is going to multiply. A lot of people are going to get this Elijah spirit. In other words, uh, this, this spirit, this Elijah individual, this Elijah spirit is going to come down take on spiritualism take on the spiritual flesh and actually dwell in several individuals all around the world it's already taking place now you know it's a shame that some of these websites some of these channels that i'm talking about refer to them as demons it refers to the elijah spirit as a demon or whatever the same individual is waiting for the elijah to come back as a person or whatever it's that's just weird stuff to think about but, you know, it's explained in the Third Testament. Like I said, these are the same individuals that denied the Messiah in the first coming. They're denying him again in the second coming. And so now they're turned over to strong delusion. Thinking that this Elijah figure like the Messiah is going to be. A person, a dude, somebody you can walk up and pinch, you know, you can walk up and slap him if you wanted to. They slapped and spit on the Jesus when he came back in the first time, I guess they, you know, think somebody going to be slapping and spitting on him this time, you know, in the flesh. That ain't happening. And Elijah's spirit ain't happening either. Go, somebody going to cut off John the Baptist's head this time. No, that ain't going to happen. Because if he did, that's exactly what would happen. That's exactly what would happen. These folk got nukes now. They find out the Messiah over there in Jerusalem. Do you know they want nuke Jerusalem? If you can kill the Messiah, you can kill the kingdom age and you can keep the new world order. You can have the new world order forever. If you, all you got to do is <laughs> they will nuke that whole town just to get rid of him and Elijah too. understanding who Elijah is. They will nuke that whole place. They thought he was at for real. No, he's coming back in the spirit. Guys, you can't nuke that. That's why they was out there killing all of them babies with with when the Messiah was born and when Moses was born because they was trying to destroy Moses and they was trying to destroy Jesus by killing all of them babies killing all of them babies just went in and slaughtered thousands and thousands and thousands of babies trying to get rid of Moses thousands and thousands and thousands of babies trying to get rid of the Messiah do you not believe that they would actually nuke somebody trying to get rid of them now verse 40 says but since they have not known how to see him it has been necessary that he manifest his spirit through a human spokesman and that he appears before those who are able to perceive him spiritually. See here? This is why everybody don't see the Elijah spirit. Some people have to get it only through the human spokesman. Only through the third testament of the Bible. See, I can explain this human spokesman thing to you. But there was a lot of people involved in the writing of this third testament. And... They were human spokesmen who were being taught spiritually by this Elijah character, this Elijah spirit. But these were spiritualized individuals. These were people who embraced the laws of Moses, embraced the laws of the Messiah. And were living outside of materialism. So they was in a position. They was having charity for their brother. And so they was in a position where they could actually have the Elijah spirit a little closer to him than the rest of us. And so the rest of us had to get it, this information through the third Testament while they got it through inspiration. 
But then we have people that's calling those individuals demons. You need to watch your mouth. That's what you need to do. It says, who are able to perceive him spiritually? Who are able? You got to be able to do that. As in the same vision in which Elisha saw Elijah riding on a carriage of fire over the clouds. Elijah has come as a forerunner in this time to prepare mankind for my arrival. That's what he does. You're waiting for the kingdom of heaven. You're waiting for the father to come down to earth. Well, you got to have the Elijah figure first. He always comes first. Now, I better run on. I'm running out of power. But it says, Elijah, a spirit of great power who has not been recognized by humanity, has always been my forerunner. Today, he has come once again to prepare the chosen. Uh-oh. So if you call in, if you if you think that Elijah fear spirit is a demon, um, well, I'll let you do the math on that. But he says he has come once again to prepare the chosen, those who have served me as spokesmen to all of humanity. Now, here's an important part. If you prepare yourselves and study my teaching in order to come to know my will, Elijah will come as your support and friend. If you prepare yourselves and study my teaching and come to know my will, look right, look over here, back over here at Malachi. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments, judgments, statutes, law. That's what it's saying over here. If you prepare yourselves and study my teaching in order to come to know my will. That's my will. That's his will. Law, statutes, judgments. If you can do that, Elijah will come as your support and friend. Support and friend. But he's going to be spiritual. He ain't going to be no you know, dude showing up at your gate talking about I'm Elijah. I'm, hey, I'm Elijah. The Lord sent me over here. No, that ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. He's coming spiritually, guys. Verse 44 says, Elijah is a divine ray who illuminates and guides all beings and leads them to me. That's his role, to lead him to them. You see, that's what I was saying over here is when it talks about this father's part, we don't know who he's really talking about. The fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. We need to go check the, um, the, the Hebrew and see what Malachi really said over there. Because it says right here that Elijah's goal is to guide all beings to me. And who is me? Me is the father that he's talking about. That's why it's capitalized right there. Then it says, love him and honor him as a forerunner and as your mediator. Forerunner and mediator. Forerunner and mediator. And what is a mediator? A go-between. An intermediary. An arbitrator. A negotiator. A moderator facilitator, referee, or umpire. Yeah, guys, this is third Elijah. Third Elijah. Now, let's look at verse 45. He says, Elijah, the prophet, the forerunner, the envoy of the third era. Now, as we said before, and I'll repeat this so it can sink in. Moses was the envoy of the first era. The Messiah in the flesh was the envoy of the second era. We're entering the third era, the Aquarian Age. We're leaving Piscean Age and going to the Aquarian Age. Elijah is the envoy of the third era. Intercedes for his flock, prays for those who do not know how to pray. I'm sorry, it didn't say that. It says, prays for those who do not know to pray. That's a difference in wording there. You have so many individuals out here that don't even know the power of prayer. And when they get in trouble, the first thing they want to do is rely on other means for their help. Prayer is the last resort sometimes. But you have this Elijah figure that's actually praying for them. And conceals with his mantle the blemish of the sinner. So like the Messiah, he was covering our faults, waiting for his regeneration. That right there is alluding to the third temple. It is during that time that we will be regenerated when those laws are written on our hearts. 
you got to remember it's sin that is the cause of most of our problems down here on earth if not all of them once we have started to reject sin which is the transgression of the law we can start this regeneration process he says Elijah prepares his multitudes his legions to combat the darkness created by ignorance sin fanaticism materialism and mankind check this out guys Elijah prepares his multitudes a lot of people will be touched by this Elijah spirit this is a spirit that plans to come down and dwell with man we are spiritual individuals guys Elijah is not coming in the flesh he's come he's coming to associate with our spirits he's coming to spend time with our spirits and he says his multitude look right here where he says his legions now I've been talking about this other channel on here and I hope this dude is listening because I believe he saw this word legion and immediately started associating this with the story of the Messiah where the guy had the demons in him and those demons said that their name was legions. We need to quit seeing demons guys if we are always seeing demons in people and seeing demons in places and seeing evil stuff that means we are evil people. Guys, you ever heard that phrase? They say it takes one to know one. If you're always talking about witchcraft, you are probably a witch. You know, and if we're always seeing demons, we need to be cautious. We need to pay attention to the people that we're hanging out with and the things that we're doing. Because, you know, evil is as evil does. The word legions means crowd, masses, hosts, multitudes, bands, throngs, platoons, or teams. Elijah comes to prepare these legions of people, legions of people, teams of people, to combat the darkness created by ignorance. That's the problem. That darkness created by ignorance, sin. And sin, like we read over there, is the transgression of the law. Fanaticism. That's believing that only your church will be saved. Your denomination. If they ain't a part of your group, then they must be in error. They must be doing wrong. If they if they ain't Muslim or if they ain't Buddhist or if they ain't Christian or if they, you know, ain't seven day Adventist or whatever it is that their religion is, they believe that their religion is the only one that's right. That's called fanaticism. Everybody else is wrong. They're right. And materialism. Materialism is the opposite of of spiritualism. These are individuals that's caught up on the things that they can see, feel, and touch. These are the things that's plaguing mankind right now. These are the things that's creating darkness in humanity right now. Ignorance, sin, fanaticism, and materialism create the darkness in mankind and the Elijah spirit is coming back to prepare his multitude of people who I believe is the 144,000 to combat this darkness well I'm gonna go ahead and end it here guys I'm having power issues over here and we have quite a ways to go this third testament has over 60 references or 60 times it talks about Elijah we've only made it up to about 20 of them so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and end this here and I'm going to start on part two so go ahead and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already so you can see that video when it comes out if you got something out of this video go ahead and hit the like button if you didn't go ahead and hit the dislike button but leave us a comment either way, guys. Your comments are very important. I do read all comments. I don't get to answer all of them these days. But I still do read every one of them. And your comments are helping to educate everybody. Your comments are adding to this story. Everybody reads your comments. I'm, I'm still quite surprised how many people actually read comments. But... There's a lot of people reading your comments, guys, and so that makes them very valuable as you add your knowledge to this discussion. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I don't know a lot about Elijah. I've learned a little, I've learned a lot in this class, 
And I plan on doing several more classes on Elijah as it seems to be the most important subject that we really need to know these days. Who this Elijah spirit is, why he is, where he is, how he is, even when he is, are all disclosed in the scripture. And so look for future videos to come out as we, dis as we pull out those truths. Alright guys, remember to support our channel. Keep praying for us. Shalom.